Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorene Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is former Governor Bill Richardson. Thank you for joining us. Great to be with you, Rene, like it's old times. Like old times. Well, I need to recap your career for people who don't quite know, and it's only a 26-and-a-half-minute show, so I'm going to be quick. You have over 30 years of public service. You are our New Mexico congressman from 83 to 97, U.S. ambassador from 97 to 98, secretary of energy from 98 to 2001. You are the 30th governor of the state of New Mexico from 2003 to 2011. And we see you all the time. You're a frequent guest commentator on CNN, Fox, MSNBC, Univision, ABC, NBC, whatever you are. The best job I had was governor. That's oh, that's nice to know. That's nice to know. Since you left um, pub, that that area of public service, you've written some wonderful books. The first one that I want to mention is called Between Worlds, and this is in effect your autobiography, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. It yes, is. and the one that I loved and I've personally learned so much from. How to sweet talk a shark. Right. Negotiation and persuasion. And From a master diplomacy. negotiator. And that is why we have brought you here today. Well, thank you for being overly generous. Well, um, there's a lot going on in the world, and I have trusted your um, evaluation of international politics for a very long time. And we need to talk about diplomacy. We need to talk about lots of things. But I want to go right to one of your areas of expertise, which is... North Korea. You're a renowned expert. Tell us about your relationship to the Koreans, North Koreans over these years. And you have to say one thing. When you describe one of your negotiations there, it was so cold in Korea. You were freezing all the time. You had to wear your scarf and coat. But you said it's hard to break the ice when you're freezing to death. Yeah. Talk, tell us about you and North Korea. Well, with North Korea, I've been there eight times. And I've been negotiating with them on political prisoners, on... Uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, I brought back the proudest moment was in 2007 when I brought back the remains of seven of our soldiers from the Korean War. And uh, I've been very involved with this country. And I think the key there, uh, Rini, is diplomacy. We're not talking, uh, we're talking preemptive military strikes and the president is off insulting the North Korean and the North Koreans insulting the president, short and fat and uh, calling President Trump old. That's not the way to negotiate. And I think we need diplomacy right now. Well, I need to ask you, what should the average American who has, you know, watches the headlines and everything, they're swinging between terror that at any minute World War III nuclear holocaust is going to start and hilarity between these high school, grammar school insults that are being thrown back and forth. We need a middle way. Tell us, what. how should we feel about all this? Well, because of the North Korean threat uh, on, uh, on missiles, uh, America, part of America in Alaska, in Guam, uh, in, in Hawaii, you know, they're, they're already vulnerable if there's a missile strike. Now, um, can they get to the United States with their missiles? Probably not yet, but very soon. So that's the first fear. The second is there's 150 Americans in South Korea. So if something breaks out, by 150,000, 30,000 troops, their dependents, American businessmen, then we've got 50,000 troops in Japan. So if either an artillery war, a conventional war, and God help us, a nuclear war, I mean, the North Koreans have maybe at least 20 nuclear weapons, it affects all of us in, in a region that is vitally important, Asia. And, uh, you know, this trip of the president's hopefully was going to maybe uh, soften uh, a path, uh, make a better path but diplomacy. But I, I, I think we're, we're nowhere near diplomacy and we're talking insults and the potential for a conflict. Well, it's very, very worrisome. I, I, th I think there was a restraining influence on him while he was actually in Asia, South Korea, Japan. We, but as soon as he got 
you know, as soon as he was, I guess it was in Vietnam or the Philippines, where those last insulting tweets came out, and you just want to roll your eyes and go, where are the grown-ups in the room? Well, you know, I've met with some of his people. He has some grown-ups, uh, General Kelly, General McMaster. Um, you know, I've talked to them about North Korea. Uh, they seem to be uh, reasonable. But I think the president is the one that uh, he negotiates like a real estate agent, like a reality star. And, and when you do personal insults with Asians, you know, you call somebody short and fat, even though they're not good people, it doesn't lead to a dialogue. And what we need is to tamper down not just the rhetoric, but the potential for uh, a, a military operation there that is going to be devastating to everybody. We can win a war with North Korea, but at what cost? How many people are going to die? This is why it's important we try to resolve this issue. Well, you have been called by many one of the, our best negotiators alive now. And um, after college, didn't you work in uh, the Congressional Relations Division of Henry Kissinger's State Department? And you were also with staff Senate for Foreign Relations Committee. So you've been in the trenches for a long time. When you were in, in a congressperson, Clinton, President Clinton sent you off on some diplomatic missions, which you write about in this book. You've negotiated the release of hostages, and you have uh, the Richardson rules of negotiation. Tell us a little about what, what I love about the book, How to Sweet Talk a Shark, is that you, you, you tell me rules that I can use in my daily life. This is not, I'm not negotiating with North Korea, but I do have some negotiating to do, and you really empowered me. Well, you know, Rini, President Clinton used to say the reason he'd send me to talk to these bad people is because bad people liked me. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you know how to negotiate. Many New Mexicans do in our legislature, our daily lives. You know, when I was a congressman, I used to try to have town meetings where you would actually try to resolve the problems right there. Casework, a veteran problem, a social security problem. I think you have to respect your foe. You have to let your foe save uh, face. You have to uh, know where you want to end up. You can't insult somebody. you got to let them get credit. Uh, both sides get credit. Uh, you've got to know where you want to end up. You've got to respect the culture. You know, when I negotiate with Native Americans or in, in northern New Mexico, deep northern New Mexico, on the acequias, you've got to know the history of, of these uh, the, the historical context of who you're negotiating with in the Middle East and North Korea, you know, with Asians, it's very important to save face. So some of those are some of the principles. Uh, there are a lot common sense, but it's the dialogue and negotiation is better than military confrontation, insults, press releases, uh, Twitter, Facebook. Those are, you know, they're all over the place. But you got to get to know people and resolve problems and show respect for one another. It's very simple. Some of your famous negotiations was the one with Saddam Hussein to get the two pilots who had strayed over the, the national boundary and were. And something happened to you in that that was a cultural thing that no Westerner probably would have known, which is when you crossed your leg and revealed the sole of your shoe. Which a is big mistake on my part yes. because I, I did not respect the culture. And the reason I did that, I was so tired. Yeah. But then I had to decide, should I apologize and say, oh, what a terrible man I am? Yeah. Well, I decided not to. And I think Saddam Hussein respected that. Um, you know, in the same way, uh, when I got the Marine out of Mexico, this young kid who made a mistake brought some weapons in. Uh, we convinced the Mexicans that, you know, he had been in Afghanistan, that there was a mental health PTSD issue, um, you know, and compassion. And, and the Mexicans responded and, and released him. So, you know, you've got to get into not just facts and substance, but respect for the culture. Another story that I love, I think it was in Sudan, the warlord who captured the Red Cross workers. Yeah, yeah. And he wanted a huge amount of money and guns and jeeps and stuff. And you had, well, tell the story about his child. And, and Well, I had learned when I got to the camp, and he had all these kids with these AK-47s weapons, but I learned he was really out in the bush that his child had died 
a three-year-old daughter because they had no health care, no doctors. Was it measles? It was something Yeah, it was, it was an endemic disease, yeah. that, and it died two days before. And I said to him, I said, look, you know, you can keep these hostages and, you know, ask me for millions of dollars, which you're not going to get, but I will get you some doctors. I'll get you some medicine. I just learned about your daughter. And he looked at me, sort of a combination. How did you know this? But then, you know, I could ba barely see a little tear that I got to him. And in the end, that was part of the agreement. A health care study, survey, some mm -hmm. doctors. And then he did, I did end up giving him a Jeep, one Jeep. <laughs> He'd asked for about 10, an old Jeep from the Red Cross, which they didn't like. But we, but we got the three out. And they'd been in, you know, in prison for two months. Yeah. Nobody could get them out. And we did. So it was a little humanity. You know, you learn about people, what their needs are. You, you strike at their heart and you show respect. And it works most of the time. So are there, you've been in politics a long time. Are, are there different negotiating styles in different administrations? And what are we to make of this administration's negotiating style? Well, this administration, it's unfortunate because I think the president, and I, by the way, want him to succeed. He is our president, but he makes it very difficult to support what he's doing. His idea of a negotiation is you insult somebody, you humiliate them. It's like a real estate deal. You know, you start at the top and, and, and land on them, and then they soften up. Diplomacy's not that way. You know, George Herbert Walker Bush, when he negotiated, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, Obama, uh, Bush the son. I mean, there's always traditional give and take, quid pro quos, uh, diplomacy that has to take place. Uh, there is uh, a measure that you take and, and, and you hope in response there's, there's something that leads to a deal. You know, with this president, he gets out of deals, the Trans-Pacific Partnership in Asia, NAFTA may be pulling out. What are we getting in return? He feels that he's helping his political base, keeping his promises, and that's it. But what are we getting in return? We're getting isolation in return. You know, this America First sounds good, but it's in this trip to Asia, it's China first, because China gets all the benefits from the United States withdrawing militarily, politically, economically, educationally. Um, I have been a fan of, first of all, you were the ambassador to the United Nations, so you were at the, the apex of, of the whole diplomatic corps. And the, the, I'm so concerned about the diminishment of the State Department and the, under the Secretary of State. He's offering huge bonuses for people to retire early. All this incredible hierarchy of experts in every part of the world that the main level of, of old the civil servants who've been there for a long time, who have expertise, who know the language, who know the culture, they're gone. We don't have anybody doing the homework, the preparation about all these countries. It's a tragedy. And these are career uh, State Department people that have been there all their lives. They've served in several countries learn many languages and they're leaving and it seems that this administration does not use them all the powers concentrated in the white house in the department of defense and our diplomats that know the culture of north korea of asia of china of latin america of mexico of, uh, where we have crises the middle east venezuela saudi arabia they feel demoralized because the state department's been cut about 30 percent from their actual budget and then the worst part is when the Secretary of State and the President doesn't use their expertise. So they become demoralized. Well, you heard what the President said. Uh, someone asked him, a journalist, you have 80% of the top State Department positions on policy unfilled. And he said, well, it doesn't matter. I'm the one that decides. I know. Well, you know, that, that, that's just unfortunate. And, and I really want him to succeed. Uh, I go out of my way when I am on television to, well, he did the right thing on this Asia trip. The trips to Japan and to South Korea were okay. He did okay there. But he got to China and the Philippines saying it's okay to be a dictator, to, human rights are not important. 
and then to withdraw from an Asian economic agreement that we'd negotiated with 12 countries. We're getting out. Well, the other 11 countries, they're negotiating their own agreement. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. We're speaking today with former Governor Bill Richardson, also former UN ambassador, and we're talking about the state of the Foreign Service and diplomacy. Do you think this is irreversible, or do you think we can build it back up can we retrieve this expertise and then use this expertise? Well, the good news is there's still a lot of young Americans that want to go into the Foreign Service that like foreign policy. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that a lot of the mid-level expertise, the senior expertise, are leaving. So we're going to have to do a lot of rebuilding. The Congress many times reverses bad decisions by a president. So my hope is that the Congress keeps the budget reasonable, but the co president can control a lot of budget issues as a secretary of state who doesn't seem to use a foreign service either. Uh, no, it's I never I'm an optimist. I think you can reverse bad decisions. Another uh, strata of institutions that's taken a hit is our intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, the president actually said that he, at one point, that he believed Putin, the premier of Russia, over what 17 of our own intelligence agencies has said. And uh, Brennan, the former F uh, CIA chief, s accused, said that perhaps Trump was being played <laughs> by Putin. This gets, um, he called the intelligence professionals uh, political hacks and really denigrated them. He walked it back a little bit and then went right back yeah. after them again. It, is this going to be irreparable damage, too? Well, this is serious damage because you mentioned the uh, intelligence agencies. These are all, many of them, career CIA people, intelligence people. They serve Republican and Democratic administration. And he insults them and he calls them political hacks. And then, you know, we spend billions on intelligence. And every intelligence agency, including President Trump's CIA director, said the Russians did interfere. They did meddle. But he seems to be playing up to Putin for some unexplained reason. But then what do we get in return? We never get anything in return. The president fulfills his emotion. And, uh, you know, the U.S.-Russia relationship we could use uh, Putin's help on Syria, on North Korea, on energy, on the Ukraine, on NATO. We don't get it. I mean, so what do we get in return from these outbursts and these insults to our own people? This is unprecedented. This has never yeah. happened before. It's not unusual. I was asked in the press, is this unusual? No, it's never happened before. Yeah. A president insulting his own cabinet members, especially intelligence yeah. community where yeah. we spend billions of dollars. And where they, you know, they know where the bodies are buried. I mean, they oh, they know everything, yeah, these yeah. people. I mean, you don't yeah. want to mess with intelligence people. Uh, you don't yeah. want to mess, I can tell you, they know everything. Even Clapper himself said that he had run out of adjectives to describe <laughs> the Trump, Russia, now the new you WikiLeaks know, the, revelations. These, these guys are career people, really. I mean, I don't even know if Clapper's a Republican or Democrat. You know, they're, they're career people, yeah. like our military. They don't get into politics, uh, and, and they're insulted for their service. That's wrong. That shouldn't happen. Um, so we're, you know, we'll have to watch how all this plays out, particularly the whole issue of Russia meddling in the elections and, mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, we're kind of waiting with bated breath to see how these things turns out. But there are, uh, and you mentioned earlier his embrace of strongmen like Duterte in, uh, in the Philippines did we talk about. He laughed when, when he said the, the media are spied. So the, this embrace of strongmen instead of democracies. Yeah, I mean, he embraces the president of China, uh, not known for human rights. He embraces uh, the head of Vietnam, not known for human rights. Uh, he embraces the president of the field, Duterte, who, who glorifies in killing drug dealers extrajudicially. Yeah, I drug, mean, drug users, dealers are anybody bad, who says, but the rule of yeah. law you know, should be yeah. paramount anywhere. Yeah. And the president hardly mentions it. 
uh, or doesn't even mention it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now we have important interests in the Philippines. Uh, you know, we've got military bases, a lot of cultural ties with Filipinos, but you know, we're on the wrong side. We're on the side of the Saudis who violate human rights. Where is America's beacon on human rights? We have always been Republican and Democrat for democracy, human rights, respect for the rule of law. And all of this is vanishing. We're on the wrong side of, of climate issues, too. It used to be only uh, the United States and Syria had left the Paris Accord. <laughs> Syria, the said, Syria went back said, hey, we're all going to fry. Let's mm -hmm. fix this. Now we're the only one. The cheese stands alone. You know, and this is uh, so unfortunate. Here in New Mexico, we care so much about clean air, the wilderness, mm -hmm. land, acequias, water. You know, we're not participants in the Paris Agreement. All the president needs to do is just listen to the scientists. Don't let politicians decide, but he derides the scientists. This is like a national nightmare. Yeah, it is. And I'm just concerned about our survivability, that they have a war on the press, war on truth, war on science, war on experts. Well, except when your family is sick, no matter what you feel about climate change or or scientists, you want the best doctor you can have to save your loved one's life. We have right. to get to that personal relationship with saving our country That's and right. just get the best, the most. The and you know, if there's one message you mentioned healthcare in the election uh, of the governor of Virginia, the governor of New Jersey, the last election uh, last Tuesday is that the most important issue was healthcare. Mm -hmm. People were worried about losing their healthcare with the debates in the Congress and the president's plan to get rid of Obamacare and Medicaid. I mean, we're a state here in New Mexico. If they lessen or get rid of Medicaid, we're in terrible trouble. We went from 400,000 uninsured New Mexicans, and I want to thank Governor Martinez for expanding Medicaid yeah. so that we got 300,000 more people covered. Right. What? They say that Russia's plan has been to destabilize mm -hmm. our institutions, and that's exactly what's happening. The average person has no idea if we're going to have a nuclear holocaust, whether they'll have health care, whether they'll have a job, what the tax yeah. situation is going to be. It's so much uncertainty. There is, and people are losing faith in institutions. But the message that I always give is I know you're frustrated nationally, internationally, be active locally. Care about your own county, your own state, your own issues, your own 501c3s, your own causes. Citizens should stay active and participate and keep voting and, you know, register whatever party you want. But just learn a little bit about the issues. and But stay local. Make a difference yeah. locally. Well, um, we only have a few minutes left, and there's still so much to talk about. Um, New Mexico is very concerned about border issues, about the wall, about DACA. Uh, you're, all, you're often appearing on these national outlets. What do you think can be done about the whole immigration situation? Well, I just had a very interesting meeting with a new Mexican consul, um, a woman, by the way, a mm -hmm. diplomat who's just been posted to New Mexico, and we talked about all these issues. Look, we were a leader in New Mexico on the DREAMer Act. We had it one of my first years as governor on licenses to immigrants. And the reason is for promoting safety. I remember John Denko, my secretary of safety, said, Governor, you should sign this bill because people will be safer. They'll have more insurance. We want to integrate these immigrant communities. And now we've got an administration that wants to put up a wall. I don't think it'll ever get funded. Uh, wants to deport 900,000 kids, many that are veterans. Yeah. That oh, are serving. That's heartbreaking. In, uh, they got to be deported. Can you imagine, you know, INS going to Afghanistan and saying, yeah. you got to go back <laughs> yeah, to. Right. Makes no sense. Yeah. And I don't think it'll happen. But, you know, it's an atmosphere of division. And, you know, it's, it's up to the Congress, I believe, to hold back in our courts. Luckily, we have a democracy that is somehow doing it. This travel ban on Muslims, ridiculous. Uh, this uh, deporting these kids that were born here, you know, that are contributing, that are law-abiding. Uh, it's just like, a, like I, I keep mentioning this nightmare, but this is where citizens can stand up. And, for instance, here in Santa Fe, support groups like uh, Somos Un Pueblo Unido that, you know, locally, our local neighbors here. That's what you should do. 
Well, not only do you support uh, the people, you also are doing some really important wildlife preservation things. How is your horse, wild horse, you and Robert Redford have set up this foundation. Tell me about that, and then tell me about the Richardson Foundation in general, which is not about horses. Well, on the wild horse issue, we were successful, not just us, but the animal groups in New Mexico, Mm -hmm. Animal Protection League, they're very effective in stopping horse slaughter. Uh, in New Mexico, uh, they had a they had a horse slaughter up that that is not operating, but the Congress is on the move to bring back horse slaughtering. <laughs> so we're fighting the Congress. We've got to find alternatives for these horses. You know, land and uh, birth control and you know medicine. We're working on that. But my other foundation, I'm very proud of. It's small, based here in Santa Fe. We focus on American political prisoners abroad, getting, I mentioned this Marine in Mexico, journalists that we get out of jail in North Korea. We worked on this young kid that came back uh, dead, basically, from North oh, Korea. Oh, a warm beer. Yeah, oh. I mean, we worked extensively on oh. that. Conflict resolution, North Korea. I'm working on this refugee issue in Burma, the Rohingyas. Oh. It's, uh, we're working on training young diplomats, uh, young women, political leaders uh, in Asia. Uh, We're working on just a a lot of different issues uh, that, uh, you know, that have been long a passion of mine. Well, thank you very much. I, 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 there's one thing, this book, How to Sweet Talk a Shark, for anybody who needs to know the (laughs) real principles of negotiation, I was so surprised at how powerful silence can be. In, In broadcasting, we hate dead air, but in a negotiation, if you let silence hang there, you can often get the person negotiating with uncomfortably to fill the silence, That's right. That's often right. saying more than they wanted That's to. Right. Being patient. In other words, put your point out. And instead of like letting talk and dominate and, and taking over and being the big shot, just let silence achieve your goal. Sometimes it works. Well, it's going to have to work now because we've run out of time. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. Great being on your show and great um, all the New Mexicans watching. I miss you all. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much. We can't ever let it be this long again. The world is changing so rapidly, and I really appreciate your perspective, particularly on international issues. Our guest today, former New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson, thank you for joining us. Again, the best job I ever had. Yes, okay. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next time. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.